Genovese mobster Jerry Catina may have been one of the biggest earners in Cosa Nostra history, but in the eyes of the powerful Thomas Eberly, Catina was a rubbish acting boss who was manipulated by Carlo Gambino and Tommy Lucchese. Let's check it out. Welcome to OC Shorts, bringing you detailed historical snapshots of the American Mafia and other organised crime. Feel free to subscribe if you like that sort of thing. Today, we are going to review a wiretap transcript of Genovese mobsters discussing how Jerry Catina was not a good acting boss for the Genovese crime family. In the late 1950s, Vito Genovese, the official boss of the crime family that still bears his name, was sent to prison for narcotics trafficking. In the early 1960s, while Genovese was incarcerated, the acting boss of the crime family was Gerardo Jerry Catina, and the acting underboss was Thomas Tommy Ryan Eberly. Catina was an extremely wealthy New Jersey-based mobster who had served as Vito Genovese's underboss. In 1964, Genovese family acting underboss Thomas Eberly was recorded on an illegal FBI wiretap talking with his brother Pasquale Patsy Ryan Eberly and Michael Genovese. Patsy Ryan Eberly was at the time the acting captain of the Greenwich Village crew and Michael Genovese was the brother of the imprisoned official boss of the family Vito Genovese. Throughout the conversation Tommy Ryan appears to be indicating that Jerry Catina is not the right man to be acting boss of the Genovese crime family. Tommy Ryan recalls a series of meetings where the New York bosses are discussing what should be done with rival boss Joe Bonanno, after some believed that he was involved in a plot to have Carlo Gambino and Tommy Lucchese murdered. I have covered this Joe Bonanno situation in greater detail in a previous video and have added the link to this in the comments below. Tommy Ryan states that there is no concrete proof that Joe Bonanno was involved in such a plot. However, Carlo Gambino and Tommy Lucchese are adamant. Thomas Eberly is frustrated that Jerry Catina is just going along with what Lucchese and Gambino are saying and the decisions that they are making. Thomas Eberly feels that Jerry Catina should seek the advice of Mike Miranda, the Genovese family's respected consigliere. However, Catina is acting alone. The FBI transcript of Eberly's conversation goes as follows. When we come out, I says, Now Jerry, next time before we go to the meeting, we get together with Mike. Jerry, yeah, okay. Now, we got another meeting. You know, I'm going to see Mike. Now the guy acts strictly on his own and he insists on doing everything on his own and this is what's happening. Now I told Mike, Mike, he, Katina, upsets everybody by his stupidity. Not that this guy is being malicious. He thinks he's doing the right thing and he's, Katina, going along with Tommy Brown and Carlo Gambino and doing whatever they say. He says they are capable, and I says they're making him, Katina, look like a puppet, a fool. And when we leave, they laugh at him. Thomas Eberly then states that Mike Miranda refuses to call Katina about the situation. Eberly believes that the Genovese should have a meeting with their family's top guys and discuss the banana situation, but that it is too late as Katina won't entertain it. Eberly said, Technically, he should make an appointment and get four or five guys over here and let's kick this thing around a little bit and see what we're going to do. But now it's too late for that too, because he's committed over here. He made these people get to the point where they wanted to reach. Katina was outmaneuvered. Tommy Ryan then goes on to explain that orders came out of the commission meeting that bosses and underbosses aren't allowed to discuss the commission's conversations about removing Joe Bonanno with the other members of their own crime families. The FBI wiretap recorded Eberly stating, We ain't even allowed to put, bring, our own capo regime 
Our soldiers, nobody, up to date with nothing. All we got is an order. These people do not recognise him or have nothing to do with him. Now, do you believe for one minute that Carlo Gambino's Capo regime, Tommy Brown's Capo regime, Steve Magadino's Capo regime, that they don't know what's going on? You can bet all the tea in China they do. But they turn around and tell us. In other words, they don't want Mike Miranda to know. They don't want guys like Benny Lombardo to know. They figure if these guys know, well, then something is liable to happen over here. They know that this guy, Katina, is a boob. I told him one day, Jerry, let's get one thing straight. Anything you and I do, Mike Miranda must know. He's got to know. He's consigliere and he's going to be consigliere. And he's got to know what's happening in the administration. We can't keep this guy in the dark. I says we would not be doing the right thing. Tommy Ryan then expresses that he is frustrated that all Jerry Katina cares about is money. He says, Meanwhile, you grind your teeth a little bit. You really press a little bit for something. And all he thinks about, and he comes up with money. Comes up with money. I turned around and told him. I said, You know, Jerry, there is going to come a time when we are throwing this thing of ours back 30 to 35 years. Tommy Ryan then goes on to recall how he warned a disbelieving Jerry Catina that Lucchese and Gambino could try and place hits on members of the Genovese family and blame it on Joe Bonanno. Eberly would state what he told Catina. I says, you know what's going to happen over there. You know, one of our guys could get hit. You, me, anybody. We could get hit from Tommy Brown, Carlo Gambino, Steve Magadino, and blame Joe Bonanno for it. And they would show that they could put Pepper up our... Obscene. And we're going to do what they want to do. Katina answers. Ah, Tom, he says. This isn't going to happen. Eberly. I ain't saying it's going to happen, but it could happen. It's something you'd better think about. And they are capable of doing this. Historically, the Chicago outfit and the Genovese crime family had been very close. And Tommy Ryan can't believe that Jerry Katina had not spoken with Chicago powerhouse Sam Giancana about the Joe Bonanno situation. Eberly is even more exasperated when he states that rival boss Tommy Lucchese had visited Chicago to talk with Giancana. Tommy Ryan was recorded saying, I told Jerry, you want me to go to Chicago and you want me to talk and find out what did Tommy Brown tell Sam. What did they talk about? How did they convince this guy here to go along with something like this? Sam knows what's going on. He knows what's going on better than anybody. Now the first thing your brother, Vito Genovese, would say, get hold of Sam, take a walk to Chicago, get a hold of Sam, find out what did they tell this guy. Number two, I told this guy here, Katina, going back three years ago, Jerry, we never went to a commission meeting that I know of in the past 20 years unless they consulted Chicago and New York. And when I say New York, I mean us. When they, we, walked in together, we were of one mind. They know what they were going to do. This guy, Katina, not one time did he even attempt to go and see Mooney. Tommy Ryan's brother, Patsy Ryan, would then say to Katina, But he, Katina is no politician. Later in the conversation, Mike Genovese would add, the guy is not smart enough. To which Tommy Ryan responds, this guy was a schemer. He was a manoeuvrer. He was an angleist. Eberly coins a word here, apparently referring to Katina's penchant to play the angles. This guy, Katina, is like a lamb they are bringing to the slaughter. That's what they are doing to this guy and he don't know what he is doing. I said to Benny Lombardo, Benny, I tell you, and I tell this to Mike too. Then, if we told Jerry, hey Jerry, you find a way to retire over here, this guy, I think he would kiss us. He'll be more than happy. Eberly is apparently saying that the job of acting boss is too big for Katina, and he would be happy to find an honourable way to retire. Tommy Ryan clearly stating, that Jerry Katina would jump at the chance to retire 
and stepped down as acting boss. Thomas Eberly then delivers a damning summation of Jerry Katina as acting boss of the family. Eberly said, Mike, he's a fucking kid. A kid, that's all he is. He's a kid with a big toy and don't know how to play with it. That's just what it is. In addition, Tommy Ryan is furious that Jerry Katina bowed down to Carlo Gambino's demands to hand over control of the rackets at the Copacabana nightclub that had been under the control of the Genovese family. Jerry Katina appears to think that handing over the Copacabana is not a big deal. The FBI transcript reads, Thomas Eberly, haven't I told you the story? After I had told Carlo Gambino about the Copacabana, you ain't going to get it, Carlo. I said, Jerry, why don't you open your mouth? Why didn't you say something? This guy is demanding. I want the Copa. I felt pretty bad about it. I'm supposed to meet Jerry, so I go to meet Jerry. He says, why don't we want to give the Copa back to Carlo? Well, there are a lot of reasons. Eberly then repeats the old allegations that Gambino accuses Eberly of disrespecting him, of being hot-tempered and hard to reason with. Eberly then tells Katina that he fails to see the connection with these reasons and Gambino's demands for the return of the Copa Cabana. Thomas Eberly, has the Copa got anything to do with this? This guy Gambino thinks he can outsmart us. He can't do that, Jerry because he's not smart enough to outsmart us. We got Benny, that's in charge of the Copa, and he's the guy that took the Copa away from them, and before he took it away, he said, let's make sure that what we are doing, we are doing right, because once we take the Copa, this guy can never take it back. I told you all this, Jerry. Now you want to give it back? Prestige is involved over here now. I have covered this Copacabana situation in further detail in a previous video and have put the link to this in the comments below. One FBI file shows that Tommy Ryan feels that under the stewardship of Katina, the Gambino family are taking too many liberties that are not being responded to sufficiently. The file reads, Eberly then blames the Gambinos for sending one of his soldiers, Joe Pagano, to jail and causing Eberly's associates to lose control of the Englewood Country Club. The club was recently sold to a group headed by Anthony Scotto, son-in-law of the late Tony Anastasia. Thomas Eberly, guys are sending our people to jail like Joey Pagano, and we get chased out of the club. Any favours you take to them, you never get it. We give you our answer, and this is what's happening. From all of Tommy Ryan's complaints about Jerry Katina, it could be said that Tommy Ryan is looking to take the top spot for himself and is just bad-mouthing Katina. However, an FBI file from the following year, 1965, shows that Tommy Ryan is trying to act in the best interest of the family and that he actually wants Philip Benny Squint Lombardo to take over as acting boss. The file reads... New York 3986C Asterix advised on 4-5 last that Thomas Eberly and Michael Genovese discussed possible change in leadership of Genovese family, resulting from stated desires of Gerardo Catina to retire from organisation. Eberly stated he would like to see Benny as boss. Benny is believed to be Philip Lombardo. Eberly claimed that six individuals agreed with his thinking regarding Lombardo. He named these six as Saro Mojavero, representing Rocco Pellegrino, Harry Sox Lanza, Jimmy Blue Eyes Allo, Jimmy Angelina, Ray DiCarlo and himself. Eberly referred to these individuals as the Colonels. Eberly stated the first thing they must do is discuss this with Mike Miranda and see what Vito Genovese thinks. Eberly apparently made this proposition to Lombardo and assured him that he would do more for him than he is doing now, and agreed to be his underboss. Lombardo desired to hold off until he heard more from Katina before making any commitment. Further details will be furnished as they become available from informant. As mentioned, Jerry Katina was a very successful mobster financially, but 
it could be argued that with Carlo Gambino growing in power in the 1960s, that perhaps Jerry Catina was too weak as a boss and not the man to lead the Genovese family in this period. Anyway, I hope you found that interesting. Thanks for watching.